I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Jeff Lowenfels, author of the Teaming With series of books, specifically about the latest volume in the series, Teaming With Fungi, The Organic Grower's Guide to Mycorrhizae. Jeff writes the longest running gardening column in the US, is a former president of the Garden Writers of America and was inducted into the GWA Hall of Fame in 2005. He lectures on organic gardening, has presented a gardening show on television, a radio show and is the founder of a national programme that has resulted in millions of pounds of garden produce being donated to the hungry. And gardening is just his side gig. I started by asking Jeff what inspired him to write his series of books, which deals with some in-depth scientific concepts around plant growth and nutrition that can sometimes seem daunting to non-scientists such as myself. And I also asked him to explain what mycorrhizal fungi actually is. Uh, All right, I will do that. Uh, I should uh, add that I am also not a scientist. I think my readers are always surprised to find out uh, that while I majored in geology in college, uh, that I was an attorney or a solicitor. And uh, so I'm not I'm not a scientist. And what I what I do as a hobby is I write a garden column in the Anchorage Daily News in Anchorage, Alaska. That's a pretty weird place to be writing a garden column, wouldn't you say? (laughs) Uh, But uh, as a result of writing that garden column, uh, I uh, came upon this this whole concept of something called the soil food web. Uh, You know, basically, it's the plant puts out sweats out things out of the roots that attract bacteria and fungus. The bacteria and fungus are eaten by protozoa and nematodes. The uh, nematodes and the protozoa poop out, if I can say that on the podcast, poop out their excess that they don't need. And that excess contains tremendous amounts of nitrogen that feeds the plant. And so the the plant is sort of running the system by putting out these exudates into the soil. Now, one of the things that these plants attract are specialized fungi. Uh, Some of the fungi they attract uh, eat other things in the area of the plant uh, or are eaten by other things in the area of the plant, and, and the plant then takes up the nutrients. But there is a special kind of fungi Uh, called mycorrhizal fungi. These are the things that made it possible for plants to take over the earth. And the reason they work is because the plant puts out a special signal that attracts a special fungus, because there's many different kinds of these mycorrhizal fungi, and that fungus invades the plant root settles into the plant root, and the other half of the fungus is out in the soil, goes out and gets nutrients that it then pumps into the plant. Uh, So you have uh, zinc and copper and nitrogen, even water, being transported from far away distances, relatively speaking, into the root because of this association of the root and the mycorrhizal fungi. And that association is known as a mycorrhiza, if it's just one root and one fungi, or a mycorrhizae, if there are a number of roots and fungi involved. And so uh, we now have mycorrhizal fungi feeding plants and forming a symbiotic relationship known as a mycorrhizae or mycorrhiza. And the strange thing about this is that about 95 to 96% of all plants on the planet Earth have this association. And until about maybe five or 10 years ago, most people had absolutely no idea that it existed. So I'm not sure that answered your question, but these fungus go out and get food for the plant. And they are attracted to the plant by uh, the plant releasing a special chemical that uh, tells the fungus it's okay to invade the plant. 
So is it always mutually beneficial? Uh, almost always. I, I think there are a couple of instances where where it can it can be a little bit more lopsided uh, in terms of the uh, of the plant actually, uh, but but it is it is a, a symbiotic relationship. We know of about three hundred and fifty or sixty different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi that exist in nature. We can reproduce uh, in the lab about fifteen of them. Uh, and these uh, are what you find in nurseries uh, that you can put on your own plants when you're working in situations that somehow impact negatively the existing mycorrhizal fungi. Now, I should tell you that there are many different kinds, well, there are seven different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, so orchids, for example, have their own mycorrhizal fungus that, that they won't even germinate unless that mycorrhizal fungus is in the area. Uh, blueberries have their own type of mycorrhizal fungus. Uh, we are, we're unable to grow that in, in a lab. So it ends up that the two that we're interested in as gardeners and growers are known as ectomycorrhizal fungi, which are big fungi that produce mushrooms, and you can see them, and they... Uh, they form these few fruiting bodies that are very, very visible. And endomycorrhizal fungi, which are very, very small, they need to be stained in order to be seen. Um, and they are the ones that infect most of the vegetable plants, the row crops, cannabis, hemp. Um, uh, and so that's the one that many, many people concentrate on. Trees generally don't need mycorrhizal fungi added to them. Uh, but but row crops and things that people start indoors, start themselves, uh, transplant, those do very, very well with added mycorrhizal fungi to replace the mycorrhizal fungi that was either destroyed during the growing transplanting process or that actually wasn't in the soil even in the first place because it was a sterilized soil or a potting mix uh, that didn't have the mycorrhizal fungi in it. Right. So I'm thinking as you're talking about if I was to say take a cutting of something like a hydrangea. So I'm guessing that has its yes. own a brand of mycorrhizal fungi attached to it. If I take a cutting, that cutting then roots um, and say I root it in a potting mix um, and then I plant it out right. in the garden. How does that kind of relationship strike up or does it, does it never or, or is it just a game of chance? Well, uh, you know, it's actually a game of chance. Fortunately, uh, mycorrhizal fungi exist in lots of different locations. And if you've been growing in that area before, there are existing spores uh, and, and maybe even existing live fungi themselves that are, that are in the soil associating with, with a plant. Uh, and they can, they can associate with that hydrangea when you put it in the soil, if it's the right mycorrhizal fungi. Now, fortunately, as I indicated, there are about 350 of them. We only know how to make about 15 of them. About eight of those are commercially available, but they sort of sleep around. And so one fungus that might uh, infect a, a, a potato plant might also be the same fungus that would, would be helpful for your hydrangea. These days, you can go to Google and actually look it up. So if, if, a, if a listener wants to know whether the plant they're using or, or dealing with uh, has a specific mycorrhizal fungi, they simply need to put the plant in mycorrhizal, and, and, and mycorrhizal fungi and see what pops up. Could a plant grow without having that mycorrhizal fungi at all? Yeah, it can. It can, but, but in that situation, you have to be take the place of the mycorrhizal fungi. So, for example, uh, many, many hydroponic systems never grow uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Some hydroponic systems that use uh, rock wool uh, can develop a, a mycorrhizae, uh, uh, the plants that are, are grown in there. But, but many times you don't have any mycorrhizal fungi. But you, what you have is yourself putting the nutrients into the solution uh, that the mycorrhizal fungi would be delivering to the plant. Uh, even in a in a conventional garden, if you're using a fertilizer, uh, for example, that's very high in phosphorus, it's it's difficult for the 
for the mycorrhizal fungi to grow because the plant doesn't put the signal out, doesn't need to. You're, you're supplying it with the phosphorus that it would get with the mycorrhizal fungi. And so uh, there are situations where the plant will do very well, but it's only because you have taken the place of what naturally would be feeding the plant. Right. So I'm guessing this has implications for establishing new crops or new gardens because, for example, I have a garden that's surrounded by oak woodland, so I'm guessing that without any other input from me, the species that would do best are also the species that share the fungi with, um, with oak trees, for example. Right, right, and those would probably be trees, <laughs> which is not what you want to grow. So, so uh yeah, what you would do is you'd be adding in mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, where I live in Anchorage, Alaska, we start all of our seeds or most of our seeds indoors early because our, our spring comes so late. And so we use potting soil, and there's no guarantee that potting soil contains the right mycorrhizal fungi. So we start by rolling our seeds in the mycorrhizal fungi. We grow the plants in potting soil to which we add mycorrhizal fungi, and then once we transplant into the soil into the uh, the garden, we we uh, roll the roots of the transplant in mycorrhizal fungi to ensure that all the way through the process the plant is thoroughly infected and and gets the benefits of these mycorrhizal fungi. And the benefits are terrific. If you've ever seen the American uh, uh, giant pumpkin contests, uh, the 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 real key ingredient these days is mycorrhizal fungi. The seeds are special, but if you use the mycorrhizal fungi with those special seeds, you get a, you know a seventeen hundred pound pumpkin, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Uh, so so yeah, they make a big difference. Like uh, cannabis and hemp growers have learned uh, that uh, the particular mycorrhizal fungi is called Rhizophagus interacides. Uh, and that particular fungi makes a huge difference, not only in how the plant grows, because it can make the plant a bigger plant, a stronger plant. It can make the plant a healthier plant. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it also can connect the plant to other plants in the area so that you get this internet of mycorrhizal fungi connected. And it doesn't even have to be the same kind of plant, which is absolutely amazing to me. But uh, uh, the network of, of, of mycorrhizal fungi underground uh, connecting trees and marigolds and primulas and, and what is just simply staggering. Again, while most people have never heard of them, almost all plants require them to grow in nature. So assuming you had healthy soil in the first place, would you achieve the same effects if you put a little bit of your garden soil into your potting mix? Yes, you might. Uh, and that's a very, very good thing to do. Uh, uh, people, a lot of people use, and I'm one of them, uh, use compost uh, for almost everything. It turns out that compost does not contain mycorrhizal fungi. And it doesn't contain mycorrhizal fungi when you think about it. It's logical. It's because there are no roots there. You've got to have the roots and the fungi, uh, you know, need the roots in order to be able to set up the system. And so uh, if you don't have roots in your soil, you're not going to have the mycorrhizal fungi in the spores. And so you, if you're using compost, definitely need to add it. If you look at the label of most uh, potting soils, they do not contain mycorrhizal fungi. If you're using a sterile soil, which is a silly thing to do when you take a look at my other books, uh, you, you, you definitely need to add mycorrhizal fungi. So these are integral parts of what I call, or what, what is called, the soil food web. And if you don't have the mycorrhizal fungi, you have to take their place. And as a gardener, that translates into work. That's never a good idea. <laughs> and does it also mean that the more plants that you grow in the soil, the healthier, or the, the, the higher the amount of mycorrhizal fungi? Well, they will, they will infect uh, other, other plants, even though you didn't you know, do the infection. I use the word infection. I guess you could use inoculation. Um, uh, but, but if you've got plants that have mycorrhizal fungi on them, they're developing their fungus. Fungus develops spores. Those spores stay in the soil. Uh, so, so all of this helps, uh, but it, but it turns out to be a pretty interesting tool. 
I mean, if you if you if you or any of your listeners have ever planted something in the garden, thought they did it right, and then everything died. Well, one of the reasons can be uh, because it lacks mycorrhizal fungi. Now, there are lots of other reasons why plants die, uh, but this is certainly something you need to put on the list if you if you are just learning about mycorrhizal fungi. They are ultimately as important as water, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to growing plants. You must have them or you are going to be doing a lot of work. I think there's there's a, a, a institute or it's associated with tree research in this country um, and they actually tested the proprietary mixes with tree uh, growth and I think they found their findings were that if you buy one of the mixes there were no actual proven benefits but I think that their objection to it was they were saying when you buy in this country at least, when you, if you buy a bag of mycorrhizal fungi, which you then need to, to wet and then add to your plant roots and, and so on, there were two objections. One was it might not actually be alive by the time you come to use it. And the second one was that, correct. as you say, it might not be the correct uh, type anyway. So how can you get around that? Or is, is that just a perennial problem with those things? Well, uh, you know, that is that is definitely one of the problems we have with mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're pretty lucky in the States uh, in that people have really started to, because of the legalization of cannabis, really started to concentrate on developing viable mycorrhizal spongi, uh, fungi. Uh, you can see the spore counts. Uh, they tell you what date they were packed, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't know how it is over here on this side of the pond, but uh, it is something that, that really needs to be standardized and looked at very, very carefully because these are very important organisms and they're very, very needed. What I tell people to do uh, if they're really uh, concerned about whether what they're using works is, of course, you can test it. Uh, but if you're growing a tree, for example, let's stick with that, that, that particular subject, find a tree of the same species that's doing well that's out in nature. And take some of that soil, just a little handful, and use that around the roots of your new plant. That's going to supply you with mycorrhizal fungi. So that's you know that's sort of a way around it. And I, I think if I were your, your you know the parent organization there, uh, you know my suggestion would be rather than necessarily buy, uh, you might you might want to try to develop your own, and that's possible as well. Uh, it, it, you, people in the lower 40, in the lower, I say lower 48 states because I live in Alaska, uh, people in the United States are growing their own mycorrhizal fungi, uh, particularly farmers. And, and uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to do. There are, again, a number of places on the Internet where you can look. The book discusses it. Um, and so, so uh, it's something that people might want to consider. And it's kind of fun. Um, all of this stuff is so interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's a, it's the right way to garden. We've been doing the wrong way, killing off these mycorrhizal fungi. And I guess maybe we ought to talk about that a little bit. Uh, using these chemical fertilizers, you know, ever since World War II, the chemical fertilizers that you buy usually contain uh, uh, phosphorus in numbers that are over uh, 80 parts per million, which translates into maybe 10, 10, 10, 10 on the fertilizer bag. The trilogy, do you have the trilogy on the fertilizer bags here? I think you do. Um, when it's over 10, uh, the, the, the plant says to itself, you know, I'm getting pretty good phosphorus somehow. Why am I wasting my energy producing an exudate and putting it out into the soil uh, to try to attract mycorrhizal fungi? I don't need to. Uh, phosphorus is the main thing that, that they bring. They also bring nitrogen as well. So if you're feeding your plant high nitrogen and high phosphorus, the plant says, I, I don't need to attract them. And it doesn't, which is which is again an interesting thing. So so depending on what you use, you might be impacting the mycorrhizal fungi. They usually, you know, they don't live forever. They live a, a couple of three or four weeks, uh, and and so if you've killed them off by using chemicals, you know they're they're not there. You have to add them back again. Um, Rototilling is another thing that people do. Uh, I know is an English invention. Uh, in fact, it was an, uh, an attorney, Jeff O'Toole. Uh, he was an attorney like me, and he invented uh, rototilling. Well, you know that makes that makes sense once, but if you rototill an existing garden, 
you're breaking up the existing mycorrhizal network that's under the soil. And that's not a good thing because it takes a while for it to reestablish itself. And, and uh, you know, that, that's why the no-till movement in the, in the United States is, is, is gigantic. Uh, people, have, people have discovered that if you want to be organic, you don't roto-till anymore. Uh, and and uh, the reason is basically because it destroys the mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. And, w- and what else can we do to, if we're not destroying it actively, what can we actually do to encourage it? Well, uh, of course, the plants the plants uh, are, are what control the signaling and the attracting of the mycorrhizal fungi. And so you want to make sure that you're not planting the 4 to 5% of plants that don't attract mycorrhizal fungi. That's sort of an interesting uh, sidelight. I always say, if, if you're growing a vegetable and your child doesn't like the way it tastes, the chances are that it does not associate with the mycorrhizal fungi. So we're talking cabbages, <laughs> uh, the brassia family, basically. Uh, and most kids don't like the way broccoli, cauliflower, you know, cabbages, kale. They don't like the way it tastes. Those plants don't require a mycorrhizal fungi. And if you plant those plants in, in your garden, then you want to be very careful not to plant those that require mycorrhizal fungi in the same soil unless you've added the mycorrhizal fungi. So if you have a, a field of, a field of uh, kale, uh, next year do not put your uh, marigolds in there because the, there won't be the mycorrhizal fungi that the marigolds need. Fascinating. I had no idea. And yeah, it's really interesting. Why, that is, why they evolved like that? Well, in some, uh, why they evolved like that? Well, um, I, I, you know, I haven't been able to find anything, but I have my own theory, and that is that they grow so fast. Most brushy, brushy, except for maybe Brussels sprouts, they grow so quickly that they don't need to associate uh, with anything. The, you know, the, the, they can get their, they can, their roots can get enough food. Uh, you know, as they grow in the soil. What happens many times to other plants is that the roots grow in the soil and you get what's known as a depletion zone around the roots because the roots have taken in through osmosis and the other methods which are described in my second book, Teeming with Nutrients. Um, They've taken up all of the nutrients and so they have a choice. They can grow deeper which takes a, a you know a great deal of energy. You got to make new cells and put them on. You know, make the root grow deep, or they can send out the signal, attract the mycorrhizal fungi, and the mycorrhizal fungi go out beyond the depletion zone and get the nutrients for the plant without it having to put so much energy into growing new roots. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So. Uh, uh, yeah, they're they're really a fascinating thing. I you know when I wrote this book, I knew very very little about them, and I, and I should probably tell you that sort of the evolution of writing the book. I, I started out with this the first book, Teeming with Microbes, uh, uh, which is a, about the soil food web, and I think I might have had a paragraph. I wrote that book in 2006. I had a paragraph on mycorrhizal fungi because back then we thought that they existed everywhere, and that they were not only ubiquitous but you know, every plant just did its own thing and, you know, you didn't have to worry about them. Then we discovered that that wasn't so, that, that some of the things we were doing as gardeners and farmers were killing off the mycorrhizal fungi, the rotor tilling, putting on these high nitrogen uh, nutrients, uh, synthetics, etc. cetera. Uh, these things were, were, were impacting the mycorrhizal fungi. And so we revised teaming with microbes and added a chapter on mycorrhizal fungi. That was t- 2000. Um, I don't know, eight or nine. And then finally, around 2000, whenever 12 or 13, there was so much new information about mycorrhizal fungi. The world just exploded uh, with information. And there were, oh God, I probably looked at about 100,000 papers to write the final the final teaming with, nutri- uh, teaming with fungi um, because there was so much information out there. We discovered all sorts of plants had associations we had no idea uh and then of course pictures developed and and uh you know we, we got better at microscopy and all that kind of stuff Big people figured out how to stain them uh so that you could see the the uh the endomycorrhizal fungi it was just a sort of a revolution and it became quite the thing to study 
uh, at American universities uh, when you were doing your graduate studies, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and and the evolution in our knowledge about them is still still going on. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely is it, amazing. Is it the same across the globe? I mean, is it is it? I I don't know where the main body of research is coming from. It sounds as if you're leading things in the states, but. Um, is it is it common to all types of soils in all types of environments? Um, I should say most soils, yes, not all, but most, uh, and and uh, uh, yes. So the the, the rhizophagus interacetes that works on the hemp and the cannabis in the United States will do the same thing in Great Britain. Uh, and and uh, I, I should add that many of the trees, of course, that you're already growing, for example, in Great Britain came from the United States in the first place, <laughs> uh, back, back pre-Revolutionary War or, re, or after the Revolutionary War. Uh, there was a great interest in bringing in, uh, so a lot of the trees that you have, but, but, but even, you know, even so, uh, uh, these, these, these mycorrhizal fungi work so well that farmers, silviculturists, people who do the tree work, uh, viniculturists, every, uh, uh, golf course superintendents, they've just been discovered. And so people are really working on them like crazy. Um, and uh, for example, at one time uh, there was a, a company in the United States that literally made and sold about ninety-eight percent of all of the mycorrhizal fungi uh, in the world. Wow! Uh, now there are many, many companies that are that are dealing in mycorrhizal fungus, and so um, it's, it's 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 a growing and, and very important uh, uh, field, and and uh, I, I encourage anybody that grows a plant to read the book uh, and to understand uh, how important these fungus are. When, for example, you walk too much around your trees, you're compacting the soil. And that compacting the soil turns out not to be good for the very fragile mycorrhizal fungi. They're very fragile. So let's use an example. Uh, here I am in Dublin. Uh, today, uh, we were at a, a, a place that had a, uh, uh, I think it's the oldest and largest windmill tower uh, in Europe. And in front of that tower is a pear tree that was planted in 1850. Now, everybody goes and stands in front of that pear tree and has their picture taken. That pear tree is not doing as well as it would be doing if they aerated the soil around it and put some kind of a, a block around it so that nobody could walk on that soil. Uh, in the United States, they were losing all of the famous palm trees along Waikiki. Uh, they were losing uh, redwoods in the redwood forests because the tourists were, were, were killing the mycorrhizal fungi. And nobody knew what to do until uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's really a guru in the subject, uh, said, wait a minute, you're killing the fungi. Just block it out so nobody can get underneath the, the, and walk under those on the canopy. It makes a big, big difference. And of course, you've got that problem, I am certain, for many of the trees that you've got in your parks uh, uh, in London, for example. Uh, too much traffic around the trees. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, in, in places like Kew Gardens, for example, they will uh, decompact the soil around the roots using, I think I'm right in saying, an air spade uh, because I think the theory is that it's actually the compaction that's preventing water and everything else getting around the roots rather than the mycorrhizal fungi. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, but but, but it, yeah, and I'm pretty sure it is just the mycorrhizal fungi. I mean, it's not compact. You can, it, Trees grow through cement. I mean, you know, it's the mycorrhizal fungi that's being impacted. So, uh, so for example, here's another good example of, of the importance of these things. Uh, I, 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 in NASA, they sent up the, the first one of the first astronauts to grow some plants. Uh, one of the space station situations, and uh, he was he he had come and I chatted with him a little bit, and we talked about the need for mycorrhizal fungi. The plants that he grew turned out to be brassias, because why? They didn't need the mycorrhizal fungi. It was just one extra thing to have to worry about and bring up the space and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, yeah, so the you know the the plants that did not do well were the ones that required the mycorrhizal fungi. And so in all of the tests that they did, <laughs> which ones did well? Huh, the ones that didn't need the mycorrhizal fungi. Interesting. Yeah, they're very important. And I, again, I encourage the listener 
uh, to understand that these are something that we didn't learn about in high school and in college, botany classes. And, you know, uh, these are, these are, you know, they've been around forever, but the science of them is so new uh, that, it, that it really is incumbent upon, uh, upon a gardener to, to learn it. Here in the UK, we are big fans of the mixed border um, and we particularly like mixing plants that come from different habitats and regions, areas of the world. Does it follow then that it might be better to plant plants that come from the same kind of um, eco-region because they might grow together better because of the mycorrhizal fungi that they share in common? It's, it's always been my my theory. Um, I'm not enough of a scientist to be able to test it out, but but that makes so much sense to me. Uh, and again, some plants need mycorrhizal fungi uh, of one kind, and 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 you know what 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 infects a daffodil bulb uh, might not be the same thing that infects the marigold. And so it's worth it to look it up, to look it up. But it, but fortunately. Uh, again, they they seem to um, associate with many one kind with many different kinds of plants, and that's that's what makes the mixed border possible. Mm-hmm. Yes, or or something like grow more fertilizer. <laughs> right. Well, that's uh, that. Of course, is true, and, and I think people need to step back and do some experimenting themselves. You know how how much of their fertilizing you know, impacting uh, how the, how their plants grow. What happens if they, you know, God forbid, didn't give them any more fertilizer? Uh, it might make some sense for people to look into, look into the possibility that mycorrhizal fungi might make it much easier for them to have not only a great garden, uh, but a lot more free time to make it a, a bigger garden. <laughs> That's true. So if people did want to do a bit more research or indeed if they want to find you online or, or get your books or anything, sure. can you just give us a few ideas where we can find you? Well, uh, you can, of course, always go to Amazon, although I hate to have the big bohemoth. Uh, go to your local bookshop and tell them that you want one of the teeming series. Uh, teeming with Fungi is the one we've been talking about, um, and it is, it's the latest of my books. I think the most popular is Teeming with Microbes, uh, which which I encourage every gardener to read. This is a book that explains how plants grow. And and frankly, nobody really knew uh, until the book came out. More gardeners, I mean, you know, we were, if I ever talked about bacteria or fungus, uh, you know, people would back off, and you know, it's oh my god, viruses and things like that. These are all things that are necessary for plants to grow, and most gardeners have no idea. What they do know is that they can take a blue powder or a brown manure and throw it down. Uh, and it grow and plants grow. Uh, you need to know more than that to be a good, good grower, good gardener. Uh, so anyway, you can find that my my email is Jeff at gardener dot com. If you have a question, you can send me uh, a little quick note. I don't answer right away, but I will definitely answer. My email is in the back of all three of the books, and uh, it's it's just something that I think you, 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 your listeners would appreciate. Slow, you know, reading. I don't think they need to be scared about the science because, again, I tried to write this like like they were newspaper columns. Uh, so you just take a deep breath. Don't don't let the fact that I'm using words like nematode and protozoa scare you. Uh, this is not high school biology. This is uh, you know Jeff Lowenfeld's uh, gardening 101, and it's simple. And, and hopefully uh, there's a little bit of my American humor might translate over into the Europe humor as well. So uh, it's, the, the book should be fun and, and people should just sort of relax and read them. But once you do, you'll never go back without question. Uh, in the United States, the movement to, to be organic has not only taken over, but it's basically won. Uh, I'm a member of a group, a group of garden writers and uh, not one of us ever writes about a chemical, uh, unless it's a bad camel. Uh, so, so uh, this mycorrhizal fungi is sort of the, the icing at the, uh, or, or I guess the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, if you can grow mycorrhizal fungi and have them be effective to your plants, you're a good organic gardener. <laughs>
I think. This stuff is, is what makes plants grow uh, without the addition of chemical fertilizers. If, if we're, if we're going to keep our soil, we need that mycorrhizal network. This fungal network weaves together uh, soil particles so that they don't wash away. Uh, in the United States, we're losing two inches of soil a year in some places. Inexcusable. We cannot afford to do it. We only have 50 to 80 years left. And uh, I'm certain you've got the same problem in, in Great Britain. We, we These mycorrhizal fungi are, are integral to, to, to making sure that the next generation gets to garden and the generation after that and the generation after that. And nothing could be more important. Amazing stuff. A very big thank you to Jeff for taking part in the interview. I will definitely be getting hold of copies of the two other books in the Team in With series. And who knows, Jeff could become the first ever Roots and All two-time guest. Thanks to you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.